Guys, welcome back to the podcast. Jay's with me from Kind of Rosso and Thunderbirds, his new project that he's working on. We're going to talk about pizza. What's life been like since the coronavirus hit and all that fun stuff that goes along with owning a pizzeria and being in the restaurant business. So, Jay, thanks for joining me on the podcast. I appreciate it. No problem. Always like uh, jumping on with you. Yeah, Jay's been uh, joined me on a previous episode that we'll link up where he talks more about how he got started and the story of kind of Rosso. So if you want to go listen to that, we'll link it up in the show notes for this episode. Uh, Jay, so what's been going on with you? How's life been treating you since for the last six months? Uh, like, uh, like who is it? Uh, Cliff or Norm said, it's a doggy dog world and I'm wearing milk bone underpants. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you know, like everybody, uh, the, uh, everything kind of, the wheels came flying off about March 12th. Uh, for us here in Texas when they started uh, shutting things down. But, um, you know, also um, the one good thing is that during the pandemic, when you make pizza, it's bad, but it's not catastrophic. Right. <laughs> you know, people, uh, we, we, uh, we always had a decent amount to go and, and stuff like that, but I mean, it really blew up. And so we've been able to kind of muddle through, even when they completely closed dining rooms in Texas, um, you know, we were able to kind of limp along and then they, open to 25 to 50 to 75 to back to 50 which is where we are now and you know it's uh obviously um i was just looking at our same store sales and in january march and the first two weeks of january february and the first two weeks of march we were killing it i mean yeah. we, every store was up and then you know we uh, march march april may were pretty devastating but we started to kind of come back and rebound a little bit um you know as people have uh settled into a routine and and uh texas has had a decent amount of uh dining customers uh we've got everything spaced out in the restaurants and all that kind of stuff and everyone's wearing masks and all that business so it's been uh bad but not the worst uh time of my life i guess yeah <laughs> if that's if that's optimistic i guess that's what it is yeah, I mean, you got to be a little bit optimistic, right? Because if you're not, you're just going to kill yourself because of all the bad things that you can think about and dwell on every day. But yeah, well, you want to be optimistic about what's happening because it's all you got to deal with. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is what it is, and we're making the, the best we can with it. And, and the good thing for us in Texas is that, you know, well, some of the states in the north are worried about cooling down. I'm thrilled about cooling down because it's dropped from like 100 to 85. <laughs> so for us, late September, October, November, even into December, we get – you know, weather in the 70s and 60s, and it's beautiful outdoor dining weather. And luckily, we have a lot of um, we have a lot of patio and outdoor space at most of our restaurants. So we can we can uh, you know accommodate a lot of people. So this is usually a pretty good time of the year for us. Uh, yeah, standpoint. that's tough. Like we're in, I'm in Boston, and I have a lot of friends in New York. And, you know, the Northeast isn't the greatest place in the world to be outside in January, February, and March. So it's going to be tough for them to kind of get through this yeah. process where if they do have indoor seating, it's not full capacity. It's 25 or 50%, but there's no outdoor dining either. Yeah, I talked to, uh, I was on the phone a couple of days ago with Pauly G and he was kind of uh, lamenting uh, what they're going through. He's, he's hoping for, you know, the, I guess they're going to start some limited dining at the end of September, but uh, you know, it's not enough to sustain without, you know, some help from these people. So yeah, either from the government or, or from the officials in the city. So hopefully they'll, you know, cooler heads will prevail. And it's funny just reading the, like the infection rates in New York are so low. They're way low before below Texas. And, you know, we're open a lot more than they are. And, and even I was just talking with my wife today. I mean, we're two weeks after Labor Day and we haven't seen this huge, massive spike in cases. So I think between people finally getting their scene under control and not complaining about wearing masks and doing the social distancing and whatever, we're, we're hopefully going to put this thing behind us and, and have a decent 21, but who knows? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, listen, we got to do whatever we have to do, wear the mask, stay socially distanced just to get through this. And then, yeah, you no, know, regardless of what you think, yeah. you know, whether you believe they work or not, I mean, really, I'll do whatever it takes to get, to get <laughs> things returned to normal. And, and then regardless, you know, if you think masks work, they don't work, you think the virus is real, you think it's fake, it doesn't matter because everybody in the world is freaking out about it and nobody's going to return to their normal behavior until they can put all this stuff behind us. So, you know what, just, close your eyes and swallow hard and 
and, and let's just get this thing behind us. And, you know, like the, the one good thing, and we were talking about before we started recording was at least it's given us an opportunity to work on some of these dream projects that yes. we did, uh, wanted to work on for a long time. You know, we, we have, uh, we have kind of which is our wood fireplace. And we launched a couple of years ago, Zoli's, which is our New York style place, you know, and Lee Hunzinger is our head, you know, pizza's, are that's responsible for all of our pizzas and he and i talk all the time about different things we want to try and different things we want to do but we're in the real world we're generally so freaking busy we don't have time to catch our breath but now you know with some shutdown we were able to kind of get in the lab and tweak some recipes and and so we launched our uh detroit style ghost kitchen which we're um running out of one of our zoli's restaurants for now um and uh, so, you know, in the off times at Zoli's, we started making Detroit style pizzas and they were really well received. It's called Thunderbird Pies. We were selling out in like 15 minutes every day and we really bumped up capacity. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, no, it's crazy. I mean, Detroit all of a sudden kind of hit a wave. There's a couple of other little cottage bakers that are doing some Detroit style pies and everybody's having good success. It's like in this, in these miserable times, it's like, it's really comfortable comforting hearty food and uh it really fills you up and and people seem to be really happy with it so that was one thing that we launched and we've got a couple others where you know we're working on a, a burger and fried chicken pot we're working on uh you know you're up in east coast um we're working on kind of like an east coast hoagie shop we're gonna yep. do cheese steaks and chicken cutlets and and one of the things we've been struggling with forever is getting the right rolls down here everything is basically like wonder bread but, uh, you know, we finally have an oven with steam injection and we can make a proper, you know, East Coast style hoagie roll with seeds on it that has the right chew on it. So we're going to start doing some some really good uh, sandwiches. And then we've also been working on donuts. So we have a lot of uh, wow. a lot of free time on our hands. So we're doing this and we're actually going to sign a lease. We think this is going to be around for a long time. So we're going to sign a lease just for a ghost kitchen space. So we'll basically have kind of a commissary kitchen where we can just it's our, going to be our idea lab and we're going to be able to make whatever we want and throw it up uh, for delivery and, and see what takes. I love that. You know, if you are, do you ever come to Boston? Have you ever been in the Boston area? I grew up in Boston. Oh, did you? Yeah, I, I grew up. I grew up in a town called Bellingham, south of Boston. Okay. And way south near Rhode Island. I went to high oh, okay. Gotcha. And then uh, my family lived in Quincy for a long time. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's South Shore. I'm on the North Shore, like the opposite side of Quincy towards the North Shore of Boston. Okay. But if you ever come up this way, I got to take you to this place. It's called the New Deal. It's it's got it's like it's not. I don't want to say it's a sandwich shop. It's more of a uh, a place where you can go get you know fruits and vegetables, and they have a lot of de Italian delicacies in there. Yeah. But they have sandwiches. Speaking of your sandwich place, they have the sesame seed rolls. But look them up online. It's called the New yeah. Deal. I'm going to do that. That's the one thing, you know, I do miss about Massachusetts. Is like every package store had like amazing sandwiches. Yes. And every package store was an Italian deli. It's not right. like, well, we're, in Dallas, we have one Italian deli, but in Massachusetts, like every place was an Italian deli and every place had ridiculous sandwiches. So yeah. And you walk into this place and you're like, really? But you get a sandwich from there and you can see the menu online. They have all of these different sandwiches. There's like a cold chicken cold cut with Italian and then like all the specialty toppings yeah. go on it. And like one sandwich is like $15, but it fills you up like for the rest of the day. There was that one uh, little like roadside package store that looked like a dump that was right near the Patriot stadium. That was like known for sandwiches. A lot of the Patriots. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was pretty cool. I mean, yeah, my wife went to my wife and my brother went both went to Boston college. So, okay. Uh, yeah been up there for a while and in fact i was telling my wife my favorite movie uh was on last night the town Have you ever seen oh yeah, that? yeah 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 i've seen that yeah <laughs> that's a good movie yeah it's it's uh listen i love boston i grew up here i've lived here my whole life i love it from june to december exactly january to through april i want to get the heck out of here <laughs> that's true it's not the nicest place in the world but so a ghost kitchen so you lease a space specifically to launch these ghost kitchens yeah we're in the final we're in the final uh stages of the lease but yeah we, we it worked out well we have a we have a big restaurant in the east dallas um and there was a a little, little a little spot right next door to it that their lease uh coming up and the landlord approached us and said hey uh would you guys be interested in taking this space and and we're able to kind of come to terms on a pandemic friendly deal structure where, yeah. you know, they were willing to work with us and, and we could kind of take it over for uh, 
an economics that made sense. And, uh, you know, now we'll have kind of an experimental kitchen um, where we can produce a lot of food, uh, different concepts all under one roof. And, you know, one of the other things we launched during this pandemic was a partnership with Gold Belly. Uh, who delivers food across yeah, the United So we've been knocking out uh, frozen pizzas from Cairo and Zoli's and uh, brisket lasagna uh, and getting them frozen up and shipped off. So we're going to continue to do uh, more of that, some nationwide uh, nationwide shipping. It's been, I mean, I, it's been really busy. Uh, you know, our brisket lasagna was written up by like the barbecue editor in wow. Text Monthly Magazine. And we sell probably six or eight of those a day just on Gold Belly. Wow, what's your most popular one at Zoli's pretty, uh, for Gold Belly? Cool. Uh, for Gold Belly, we do a, uh, a Sicilian uh, square with pepperoni is probably the uh, the, the the biggest uh, thing. That That's we do. A- you know, Lee Honzinger again, our pizzas are. He yeah. won uh, the Caputo Cup for uh, pan pizza uh, last year. That's right. Uh, so he, uh, so he kind of, we perfected that Sicilian crust and we've been messing around. We started off doing take and bake at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, cause a lot of people for whatever reason wanted to bake pizza at home. So we started doing take and bake from fresh and taking, and, take and bake from frozen locally. And then, uh, hooked up with the guys at gold belly and, and we're able to, uh, string a product that works out pretty well. I'm gonna have to go check that out on gold belly. When we get off this call, I may order one. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this. So you're doing the Thunderbird, right? Thunderbird's pizza, which is a new concept, like a ghost kitchen concept. Why a new concept versus just adding Detroit style pizzas to the menu of Zoli's? Uh, we just thought it would be, um, fun to do another brand. Um, yeah. and then you know, there's, there's eventually, uh, thoughts down the road once we get through all this, who knows, maybe Thunderbird becomes its own standalone, uh, thing. And we, we thought about, running it but it just gets lost in the shuffle it's always always has its own kind of high energy intense brand and we're already doing round pies and sicilian pies and we wanted a way to differentiate uh and just have a kind of a standalone because it is it's you know similar to sicilian you know same maybe same dna but it's it's a really different pie yeah um, you know with the kind of the frico crust and the wisconsin brick cheese and there's more cheddar cheese and i mean I don't, it, we don't really use mozzarella on it so um, it's a, it's a different kind of animal altogether. So we wanted to keep it separate in the case that we wanted to spin it off until its own location, uh, down the road. And, you know, that's the other thing too, is we, as we've been going through this pandemic, we're still looking at growth opportunities, but you know, before maybe we would look for 4,000, 5,000 square feet for a restaurant. Now we're, we're going to look at 3,000 square feet. Um, just so if we ever get ourselves in another pandemic, we don't have to, you know, worry about a huge rent number on these right. spaces. And, and we're also configuring it for, you know, a high number of uh, to-go uh, orders. You know, I looked at the numbers. We're already, we already blew away our to-go uh, off-premise sales. Uh, year to date this year versus the entire year last year by like 40% ahead of, of where we were. So wow. it's going to be, there are some people that are just probably never going to be comfortable with dining in again. Uh, so we want to be able to cover everybody we can. Yeah. I think that's a great idea too, right? Like, and if, what if you started Thunderbird and the pizza nobody liked and you're like, yeah. okay, maybe we don't have to start. Maybe we shouldn't take that. You don't have to take it off the menu. You can just be like, all right, it's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, exactly. It's, so it's, it's much easier that way he's to ramp up and ramp down and, you know, and then we can also, uh, once we figure out how to do it properly, we can, you know, expand our service area and run it out of some of other restaurants and, and cover a wider delivery area. So uh, it gives us more flexibility. Uh, and it seems like, you know, it's something unique. People get all excited about some secret little niche brand and yeah. it's a good way to build a following. I mean, selling out in 15 minutes is a great marketing strategy. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a uh, part of that was just, it's, it's all we could do between our off time and Zoli, you know, we started off making 30 pies a day, then to 60 to pies a day. Now we're up to 120 pies a day. And, you know, there are days when we don't sell out 120, but uh, we sell out of them more often than not. And now we're able to, you know, we can get a, a good three, four hours before we're out of pies versus, you know, 15 minutes. So yeah it makes it a little, a little easier. It's not as, I mean, that's one of the things that drives me nuts down here. There's great barbecue in Texas, but you know, you got to show up at 9 a.m. You got to get in line and they're all, only open Thursday and Friday. It's like, come on, man. I just want to <laughs> slice of brisket. Yeah. <laughs> right. I have that kind of energy to wait in line. I know. Right. Especially for two hours at 9 a.m. for some barbecue that you're probably not going to eat till later. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm fascinated by Detroit style pizza. That's like one of my favorite styles. There's a couple places around here. It's starting. I feel like it's starting to to grow a little bit, almost like what the Neapolitan style pizza did 10 or 12 years ago, where it started to kind of expand outward from New York and go more across the country. I feel yeah. like Detroit's starting to do that. Yeah, it seems like uh, you know we're seeing a lot more activity. I think um, you know everybody knows who Buddies is uh, yeah. in Detroit, and and uh, we're even starting to see there's a chain called Jets uh, that's out of Michigan that they make for a chain place they make good pizza and it's yeah. you know Detroit style, and so we're starting to see a couple more of those pop up even uh, down here. So it's you know it's it, like I said, it's one of those pizzas that I mean if you like Neapolitan has a lot of people that like they either really love it or they really hate it. It's like, Oh, it's too soft. There's not enough toppings. Yeah. Yeah. But Detroit is one of those ones that's like, man, there's no, there's no way that you can hate this pizza because it's, you know, has crispy cheese, yep. a ton of cheese and can hold a lot of toppings and you can put whatever you want on it. And it's pretty awesome. Yeah. So it's like one of those things, um, uh, that I, that I think is right down the middle and, you know, works well in the urban core of the city. It works well in the suburbs. Uh, it's, it's a very inoffensive style of pizza. Yeah, that's true. And you can, it's very deliverable too. Yeah. It is deliver. You know, that's the thing. It, it also, it reheats really well. I mean, sometimes I'll take a Thunderbird home and, uh, you know, my family are all jerks. They're not huge pizza eaters, but you know, that <laughs> way, and, uh, I can eat, I can eat that pizza for like three or four days. I, and I mean, just pop a slice in the toaster oven and it heats up perfect. It's a, it's a, it's a solid pie. And that's why we're, we're probably going to end up putting that on gold belly too. Once we kind of get our operations squared away because it, it freezes well, it travels well, it reheats well. So it's, it, it's, I mean, that's a pie that's built for long distance travel. Why the name yeah, I, Thunderbird? I, Where'd that come from? Uh, we were messing around with it for, for so long. There's so many different things we wanted to do. And there's so many names that, you know, could have been construed as offensive. <laughs> so we, uh, these days, I'm afraid to piss anybody off. So right. we, were, um, we were just uh, joking around with it, trying to come up with like a, a Detroit style, something that would... Um, you know, evoke Detroit and, you know, cars, obviously in Motor City and, and uh, we didn't want to be too obvious. And we kind of like Thunderbird just kept one that kept coming back to, and it's kind of a popular name out there in the restaurant world. A lot of people use Thunderbird, but we're like, eh, if somebody really has beef with us, if that's why it's a pop-up, we can change it and flip it around if we need to. But it just really, uh, it just really stuck with us. Um, it almost, uh, I was lobbying hard for uh, shine box pies, you know, from Goodfellas, you know, go home and get your shine box. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, I rejected on that. And only a couple of uh, kiss uh, related uh, ones. Love gun pizza was rejected. Uh, <laughs> it probably would make somebody mad, but uh, you never know who knows. It's hard nowadays, right? Like you always, uh, even me, I'm, I'm kind of like a just say whatever I say kind of guy. And even me, I try to, I, I tend my, I find myself to kind of be like, all right, maybe I shouldn't say that. Yeah. Hold you back um, a little bit. I have a couple of people on staff that say, no, we can't do that. So yeah, I'm happy to have those people. I need to have a hire a couple of those people. I don't have any of those on staff. We need to, exactly. nobody listens to me anyway. I just kind of say whatever I say. Sometimes it gets me in trouble, but I try not to be offensive. Uh, but I like that. So what do you think? Uh, so do you have any changes in your business that you think are going to be changes? Cause I think, you know, as, as crappy as this is the situation we're in now, I almost feel like it was an opportunity for folks to really look at their business and say, Hey, you know what? There was a couple of things I was doing in my business before that I didn't enjoy or didn't like, or weren't profitable. Now it gives me the chance to kind of get rid of those things. Was there anything in your business that you weren't really too keen on that you changed? Yeah. I mean, there's a, just the way what it really helped us do, especially when they completely shut down uh, dining rooms, you know, so there was no dine in and we had to kind of pivot really quickly. Um, we really revamped a lot of the way we did our to go business and um, the way we staffed our kitchens and whatnot. I mean, it, you hate to say it, the revenue levels were really low, but our our profit margins were sky high when we had no dine in traffic, you know, right. we just kind of control labor and the, you know, the, the work, the work you're doing is really, um, is really effective because, you know, you have no other choice. It's right. just, that's the bottom. So we've kind of re revised our labor models. We've really improved, um, 
you know, narrowed down the menu op options, a couple of things we dumped that maybe weren't working and we're going to continue to evaluate that is making sure, I think it really makes, makes you take a look, look at like, where am I spending every, every penny of my labor dollar to make sure that it's adding to the business or adding to the bottom line. And, you know, we're not just like, you know, have something on the menu or doing some process because it's a sentimental favorite of me right. or one of the chefs or whatever. So it has you take, I think, a more realistic look at the business. And, you know, we're also, like I said, you know, we've been, we've actually had a restaurant under construction during this whole pandemic. And, oh, wow. um, you know, it was supposed to open forever ago, but, you know, we had uh, problems with suppliers, problems with our contractor, you know, problems with the trades, problems with permits. And so I think, you know, we're theoretically supposed to get it in the next week turned over to us. So we should be able to open October. And, and this is one of those only times where you're building a restaurant and you're like, I'd be freaking out if we were normally had like a six month co construction delay, but now I'm like, eh, what are you going to do? Right. Uh, so we'll end up opening in October when the weather's beautiful and we have a huge patio. So, okay. There's just, silver lining in that and, and that's one you know this kind of reflects the world where it's only a 3,000 square foot restaurant but it's not too far from it's right in the neighborhood where the Cowboys Stadium and the Rangers Stadium is going to be so it'll be uh, interesting uh, and that's the other thing we, we didn't have to worry about missing baseball season with all the fans and right. Cowboys will be at 25% capacity and, uh, and now the, they just uh, announced a couple of days ago that the Rangers Stadium is going to host the World Series and a bunch of divisional playoffs so hopefully we'll get some uh, you know buzz in the neighborhood just in the time that we're opening so it should be uh, pretty good and you know we're also looking I think just in general, I hate to say it, but there's probably too many restaurants. It, you know, there's probably too many restaurants in your city. There's too many restaurants in my city. There's some that were just limping along. And this, I mean, this pandemic will probably clear out a lot of the low hanging fruit of places that really shouldn't have been around or haven't yeah. been to the times or whatever. And, you know, I think when we do finally get through with this, the people that have uh, like thought, through and and save for a rainy day those are the ones that will continue to thrive and and you hate to say it but it was probably a necessary calling to you know get rid of some of the, the people that were just you know cluttering the marketplace you know for a limited number of diners yeah you know, they only the, the survival of the fittest i guess yeah and the best ones right like those restaurants that weren't great or the owners you know maybe threw in the towel long ago but the doors stayed open are the ones that are closing now because you know what they were done anyway yeah. Yeah. They were done before they knew it. They were just kind of lingering on and now it gives them an easy way to kind of gracefully bow out and, and the people that are left should really, you know, take advantage of uh, the opportunity with, you know, diners that are probably going to be, when we get the all cleared, people are probably going to be like, I'm ready to go out. I mean, I know, yeah. I know we've saved a ton of money because, you know, we're not traveling. We're right. Not really no, same here we're not really going anywhere or doing anything. So I'm hoping that uh, when we finally get the all clear, everybody's ready to dump that money back into the economy. Yeah. I went out to my first restaurant, like and actually ate in the restaurant last week or two weeks ago for the first time since, you know, February, you know, I've gotten takeout a ton, but I've never, I haven't eaten in a restaurant uh, for a long time. And it was just the first time. And it was, it was, it was not as awkward as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Uh, and it was a pleasant experience. It was not crowded at all. Everybody was kind of spaced out and I felt super comfortable. Yeah. That's the thing down here. You know, we've been eating in restaurants as soon as they open dining rooms, you know, I'm in the industry. So I went out to support my friends and yeah. mostly I wanted to see how other people were, uh, you know, heading, handling the protocols. How are they, how is their staff doing it? How was the restaurant set up? What was it like? And we went out and, you know, aside from getting used to wearing a mask when you're walking around the restaurant and now really when you're going anywhere, once you're once you're at the table it's like eh, this is all right I, yeah you know, i'm not crazy about the uh the qr menus where you have to scan the icon on your phone and look at it that way i'd, I'd rather have a paper menu but it makes people feel better so i mean i guess i don't care that much but we've had good experiences all the restaurants i haven't been in any restaurant where i've been like freaked out or you know people are coughing or losing their mind <laughs> or anything like that uh, it's been good. And we've been, we've been going out a bunch, you know, Texas, we're a little more cavalier down here than probably some of the other places, which is why we had that bad spike for a while, but it's, uh, it's getting under control down here now. And I've, re I've really had good experiences at, you know, all the restaurants down here. And I've picked up a ton of best practices, uh, from going to buddy's restaurants, uh, down here just to, to see what they're doing and how they're doing it. And, and to, 
uh, I think the biggest challenge has been how do you, you know, part of the rest, part of the thing going to a restaurant is the food, obviously, but it's also the experience and the hospitality. So yes. How do you balance, you know, being safe and having your employees and staff worried about catching the virus with making it a hospitable experience? So, you know, we've gone through, you know, where we had like, you know, blue painters tapes on tables with big X's and pizza box stacked up to create barriers to uh, things like that. So now it's like, okay, let's get back to the point where we're, you know, welcoming people into our restaurant because they want to have a good experience and let's make it not so crazy with 5,000 signs all over the, uh, taped up all over the place that said, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. There's, there's ways of saying things, there's a way, there's a way to present things to make people feel like, okay, I shouldn't be freaking out about coming to this restaurant. Right. I think it's important, especially now moving forward, like in the beginning, you could get away with that, right? Because it was like an unknown. You didn't know when it was going to end. But I've been in this a little bit. How are we going to make it a more, like you said, hospitable place for people to come in and enjoy their time and look forward to it versus, ugh, I kind of freaked out that now you're making me, you're reminding me of it. Yeah, exactly. Like, I don't want to have, I get it. I know that I need to wear a mask. I don't need to see a sign every two feet telling me to wear my mask. And right. I'm also not going to lose my mind if I see, you know, a server that's been working a shift for 10 hours, pull their mask down for one second to take a breath. It's like, right. I'm going to be okay. Yeah. It's one yeah. of those things. So. Yeah. Do you do any third party delivery? Yeah. That's, we, we, you know, I always said that and my brother still lives up in Massachusetts and Franklin and, and, you know, he, all their little restaurants have their own delivery guys. And I don't know if I'm just an idiot or a dummy, but I cannot figure out how to make in-house delivery work by myself with my own people in their own cars. And <laughs> yeah, five orders. How's this guy going to, how am I going to time this so this guy can deliver them to these neighborhoods? And this, I, to me, it's too much of a headache. You know, I, it's a necessary evil down here. You know, Uber Eats is the 800 pound gorilla. And, you know, we've messed around with other delivery services, but they don't have the reach and the branding of Uber Eats. So we have, we have a, now I would say, I wouldn't say a good relationship, but you know, we have a relationship that I don't want to murder Uber Eats every day. Uh, <laughs> we were able to, you know, at the start of the pandemic, we were able to kind of negotiate a theoretically reasonable delivery rate, you know, so we're not in the high thirties. It's, it's a delivery, it's a commission rate where, um, I don't feel that I could pull it off myself for the same amount of money. So, um, yeah, we use Uber Eats and, and Uber Eats has been very helpful. I, you know, it's easy to cast them as a villain because they do so many villainous things, but, um, they, you know, they, they make it really easy when you're in the ghost brand, ghost kitchen business to say like, I want to pop, you know, I'm going to pop up, you know, a delivery page on Uber Eats for Thunderbird and I can get it done in a couple of days. And now all of a sudden I have a, I have a third business that's viable. And viable. Right. And it just, you know, people see it on the app and, and, you know, nobody wants to call anybody or talk to anybody. They just want to press a button and have the food show up. And yeah. That's the, that, honestly, that's the most efficient way to do it. I hate to say it, but you know, they have a, they have a, a good product um, that works for us for the most part. I mean, you have some outliers where some of the couriers are nuts or, you know, they eat half the, you're not going to believe it. Your pizza didn't show up. I, I picked up, oh, I ate it and it's in the backseat of my car. But, uh, you know, you have a few of those every now and then, but they're easy to spot. I mean, we had some of those. We had a lot of delivery drivers when I operated and we had some of those and they worked for us. So there was no excuse. No, no, that's what, I mean, I wish I could pull that off. But, you know, I also think that we're now, I don't know how I could pull it off with a delivery driver with the amount of to-goes that we do. It's just like so fast and so furious. It's just, I think it just gets out of my hands too quickly. So who do you have for your point of sale system? Uh, we use Aloha. Okay. So we had a point of sale system. So it was always that balance, right? And we still, we always kind of struggle with this between the balance of having enough delivery drivers versus not having enough delivery drivers. Right. Because for two reasons, you want to keep the customers happy. So you want to have enough so that orders get there in a timely manner, but you also have to worry about keeping the drivers happy. So they stay working for you and they right. make enough money. Yeah. You know, and that was one of the things too. We, we use some other delivery services uh, in the past part of Uber Eats and part of the problem was we didn't have the pizza ready we didn't have no couriers available the couriers weren't making enough money so they stopped working for them and so it's like if you can't if you can't move your product on a third-party delivery service what's the point of having it right 
And I think a lot of people just bash the third party delivery because of that. They see the fee, which is a hefty yeah. fee, but you got to be able to like negotiate with them. And maybe it could be a win-win for you and them. And like you said, it's not always right for everybody. Maybe you're in an area where you have a really small delivery area and you can manage it better than someone right. who's in a vast area. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I think one of the other good things to come out of this pandemic was I, I think that, um, you know, the consumer, the end consumer didn't realize the amount of fees that yeah. restaurants were paying to the delivery. So now we've actually had a, a big rising sentiment of like, look, if I want to help my local restaurant that I love, I'm going to order from them and go pick it up direct because I know that it's, it's better for them if I do that. So there has been, you know, a good amount of support for that where people at least have realized like holy crap you mean that uh i'm paying delivery fee and i'm tipping the guy and they're taking 35 percent from my favorite restaurant then people are saying i'm just going to hop in the car and uh go grab that pizza myself and and it's also kind of nice it's like geez i can finally get out of the house and take the three mile drive to my pizzeria and just you know and you don't have to do anything you sit in your car you get there you text them somebody comes out and they'll put it in your trunk or your back seat and you never have to talk to anybody so yeah yeah you know Hey, you get out for a minute, take a nice drive, and there you go. I mean, plus, you, like, you're running a ghost kitchen, right? Do you think ghost kitchens would even be around if third-party delivery wasn't a thing? Uh, no, I mean, for sure. It's just it enables so many people with a good idea and a good product to go live in a short amount of time. It's like, yeah. look, you know, I always tell people the easiest part of this business is cooking food. <laughs> the hardest part is everything else. It's yeah. all the logistics and, you know – keep an eye on your money and, you know, running stuff like that. So, so if you're, if you're a good cook and you have a good product, but you're like, shit, I don't want to mess around with, you know, any of this other stuff. It's like, yeah, use third party delivery service. You can get your stuff out to people. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Like I, I just, like you said, I don't think that there's going to be a lot of people leveraging these ghost kitchens and testing out ideas that turn into big businesses after the yeah. testing period. And I don't think that would be a thing if the third party delivery weren't around. Yeah, I mean, they certainly enable that, um, you know, not only for restaurants. I mean, you see uh, tons of restaurants. I mean, even Chili's is doing like a chicken tender ghost thing. And even now Cracker Barrel is doing a ghost kitchen. So it's not just, you know, smaller operators like myself. It's, you know, big corporate chains are saying, hey, we can we can work on some of this other stuff, take some of our greatest hits and spin it off into a little ghost brand that's for delivery only. And who knows what happens in the future? You know, I'm sure like, like us, a lot of these well-funded guys are looking to say, okay, when some of these restaurants start closing in desirable yeah. areas, I can, you know, snap up a, a small space for a good deal and we can launch a new brand. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, I see you got a pretty good following on Instagram too already for Thunderbirds. That's great. Yeah, no, it started off uh, pretty good. Our, um, our marketing guy is a, is a pretty funny guy. So he, uh, usually comes up with some comedy gold to get people engaged. Thunderbird Pies on Instagram is your handle if you want to go uh, follow them and see what they're up to. What would you give people, uh, anybody who's listening to the podcast or watching this on YouTube or Facebook, uh, any advice you can give them on how they could, you know, get better at business nowadays or what do you have to say to them? Um, yeah, I mean, I think now's the opportunity. Now's the, like we talked about earlier, this is the best time to fine tune your business. Get rid of the stuff that doesn't work. Focus on the core stuff that is, you know, bringing customers in and what you're known for it is now the time to get back to basics. Really, you got to get your operating efficiencies under control and perfect your product, develop new products, test things out. I mean, if you got to balance between really fine tuning what you're doing, but also, uh, you know, balancing out with some creativity to try some new things too. Cause you, you know, look at, look at your market, see where the gaps are, see who's not doing something or see who's, who's doing something that you think you can do it a lot better and you know now's the time to make a move and rush in and fill those gaps that are going to be left by restaurants closing and customers wanting something uh new and interesting and you know something to stay relevant and you know you just got to be ready <clears throat> i mean we're eventually going to come out of this so you really need to be ready and not get caught flat-footed when all of a sudden the floodgates open back up and there's a vaccine and everybody has it and everybody that's been sitting on all their dining money is now rushing out to say <laughs> for a month, I mean I hope a Monday's as busy as a Saturday uh, but you know don't get caught with your pants down because people will also be freaking out if they come back and you're not ready to handle it yeah 100 percent Jay thank you so much where can people go say hello to you or follow you on any social platform or your website 
they can go to, you know, Connor Rosa, Texas on Instagram, uh, Zoli's New York Pizza on Instagram, Thunder River Paws on Instagram. Uh, and we also, all those same things on Facebook. I mean, we're all over the place. Instagram is usually where we have the most fun. So follow us there. That's usually a lot of, a lot of good stuff. We'll link it all up in the show notes for this episode as well. So Jay, thank you. I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much for hanging out with me for a few minutes here. Yeah, no problem. Have a good one.